Was that like a random dinosaur running across at the end of that? I, no, it was random. Absolutely not. Guys, <laughs> today it's such an honor to have um, Fred Sanford. Pastor Troy. Yes, that's my name. Pastor Troy Brewer. Yes. Come on. What's it up? It is buddy? I fear not. That's the Come scripture. On. Everything I say is the Bible. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> this is going to be amazing. I'm so glad to be here, You've man. You've been blowing our minds since, since you got here. Thank you. Thank you very much. You guys are very, very, very teachable. Y'all have changed my message. I came up here to show you guys how smart I actually was, and I didn't get to any of that. All I, got, all I did was show was you guys your, how crazy I was. That was your dumb stuff, yeah, I, I said? <laughs> <laughs> There's really not much of a smart bone in me. There's a huge Jesus bone in me. A come huge on, come on, Jesus come on. And kingdom bone in me, but... But nonetheless, no. Uh, last night was great. Uh, I actually ended up teaching on time and on bringing redemption into timelines. And then today I was talking about maintaining your passion and why we have to be passionate people. But you guys already know this stuff. I mean, y'all, it's not like I'm, it's not like I'm bringing something you guys are not already walking in. I'm just bringing a different layer. Come on. And I love now, that. Now, pause, as James Gall said, pause. Really quick. Oh, oh. This is going to bother me. Don't hurt me. I'm a bleeder. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That, yeah. No, I'm good. Okay. Yeah, I forgot we had a camera on. Hi, guys. How y'all doing? Call you blessed. Camera two. The time thing last night. Yeah, the time thing. Inviting redemption, inviting Christ himself yep. in, into anywhere in your, in your timeline, knowing that when you invite him in, that his redemptive grace comes in and begins restoring everything out yep. and, and from that point forward and back. That was powerful. Well, I, I came to a realization several years ago of what time is all about. I, I've been studying time since I was a very young man, and I love time. I love, I like H.G. Wells. I like time travel. Yeah. I love anything yeah. that has to do with time travel and fun stuff like that. Um, but I come to realize that in the kingdom that time was created by God for the purposes of redemption. And that a lot of people actually think that God is time somehow. You know, the whole time, you know, father time, right? Because there's actually a confusion. People think that God and time are not. Listen, God created this table and God created time just like he created this table. This table has a purpose and time has a purpose. And this table has a beginning and an end and time has a beginning and an end. And it, time was created for the purposes of redemption. So when you bring redemption into a time change, or I should say into time, it actually changes the flow of time. And so last night we were, I was walking you guys through that and just saying, hey, this is how it is in the book of Genesis. This is where we know the timeline begins. We can actually tell biblically... Pastor, what's your name? Fred. Pastor, yeah, Pastor Jason. Fred. Thank yeah. you, Jason. And Derek. and I know what your name is, Derek. Yeah. So anyway, there's... Carl, there's, Bruce, <laughs> Henry. <laughs> Sorry. John, go, go on, Jacob. <laughs> Jacob. Okay. okay. Let's start over. Let's run the beginning. intro again. And <laughs> It's actually, you can actually tell where the timeline begins and where the timeline ends. The timeline actually begins at the fall of Adam. It doesn't begin at the birth of Adam. It begins at the fall of Adam because Adam did not enter into the timeline until the day that he sinned. In the day that you eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. A day is to the Lord a thousand years, and he died 930 years later. So he entered into the day. The clock started ticking for him when he entered into sin. So I know that time and space and matter are in perfect continuum, meaning you cannot separate them, but it's also in perfect continuum with sin and death. So what that means is Adam was not subject to time, to space, or to matter until he was subject to sin and death. So 
at the very end of the timeline is actually the great white throne judgment. And then it says after that greatest, after that final act of redemption is done and the final judgment has taken place, it says, and time shall be no more. And then we enter into eternity future. But the 7,000 year timeline from 2,000 years from Adam to Abraham, 2,000 years from Abraham to, to Jesus, 2,000 years from Jesus until now, we're right near the rapture of the church. So I'm never allowed to say the word rapture. And then we enter into, then we we'll enter. just edit that part out. Would you edit that? Thank you. And then we enter into the last 1,000 years or the millennial reign of King Jesus or the seventh day of rest, wow. right? And rest is not inactivity. Rest is when Jesus has dominion Come and has, has rule without opposition, when he's fully made manifest. And then at the end of that is the great white throne judgment, and then time is no more. We don't need time anymore. Why? Because there's no more, there's no more purposes of, re of redemption. The plan of redemption has finally been accomplished. So what that means is if you have time, you can enter plans of redemption into time that changes time. Fascinating. You were saying that sin puts us into the clock. That's correct. Yeah, so... And that time began at the fall in, in Genesis 3. Yep. And yet time wasn't a the result of the curse, that time was almost this this blessing that the Lord hardwired or embedded into the human condition at that point. Time is a blessing from God. It was like the secret weapon. It was the, it was the trick up God's sleeve that he had that if Adam sinned, he would fall into time. And time is the only place that you can work an act of redemption through relationship that says that was then, this is now, and this is the promise of the future. Wow. So, at when, when, as soon as Adam sinned, he fell into that and went, oh, no, where am I? And then God shows up in Genesis 3 and gives the promise of the seed of the woman and says, the Messiah is going to come through you, through humanity, and actually enter into humanity. And so you see God revealing through his relationship all these layers of the story of redemption throughout the centuries, but it's in a place that is throughout the centuries. Einstein has this famous thing where he says, time is God's way of keeping everything from happening at once. That's awesome. He, yeah. God didn't want it to all happen at once. He, wanted, he would risk everything for the sake of relationship with us, and I love that. He does that within a time frame, and the only way we can enter into that is to fall and he knew we were going to fall. He created us in such a way that he literally risked everything knowing that we were going to fall, but also knowing that he could have relationship with us in this time frame that he could reward us for eternity for how, he, how we knew him inside the timeline. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. And there's something that's happening, a parallel between what's happening in the church right now and versus what's happening in the world, in our understanding of, of time and perhaps even some of the scriptures that we've read for years in regards to how time changes once, once your own storyline gets redeemed and restored in the cross when Jesus said yep. that he whoever believes in me would not perish, right, would not die, Come on. but would have everlasting life. Okay, and that's, you read a time, all, that's a time shift. Yeah. Because you go from losing everything to gaining everything. All right, for, Paul, said, Paul said, for me to die is gain, is gain. Like, how does that work, okay? So what happens is, in, in the flow of unredeemed time, time is this great equalizer. It's like, it's kind of like, you know, Samuel Coat. You know, Samuel Coat invented a pistol, and he's the one that made man equal, right? You know, that thing, it's like God didn't create man equal. Samuel Coat did. Once everybody had a gun, then they were all equal, right? Okay, well, time is like that kind of a pistol that says, I don't care how big you are. I don't care how big I am. It doesn't matter. We're all subject to this thing. And so what happens is within, within a timeline, within the time that all of us belong to, what's real is everybody in non-redeemed time is losing everything. Hmm. We're losing everything. We are perishing, okay? And time, if, if, if you're unredeemed, time makes sure that there's an ending to that. If you are redeemed, if you are redeemed, time makes sure that you are gaining everything. If you're unredeemed, time makes sure that you are losing everything. But if you are redeemed, time makes sure that you are gaining everything. That's amazing. That's awesome. And that's how God, that's how God created time to work. So, so it's like a, a restorative government around redeemed time. Around and redeemed how it's time, operating within the life of a, of a, of a son. Exactly, that's and which beautiful. which is all about relationship, right? That happens within a timeline. Wow. So, wow. so the Bible gives us, all, so we know that there's different kinds of time. So like just in our own vernacular, we'd say, okay, there's past time, there's present time, and there's future time, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, well, the, the Bible lists all kinds of time, okay? Like, the Bible talks about times and seasons. Times are timelines, and seasons are time circles, mm. Mm. okay? And linear time has a beginning and has an end, and a linear time is always centered around some epic event. Circular time is seasonal, and the Hebrew word for circular time is called moedim, and it means prophetic appointment. And it's meant to be incredibly predictable, wow. you know. So if it's fall time, I know winter time is coming. If winter time is coming, I know spring time is coming. Well, just exactly like that, when it comes to times and seasons, mm -hmm. they are meant to be predictable. So one of the things that you find is any time in the Old Testament or even Jesus in his ministry, when he's acting in a prophetic form, he's going circular. Wow. So when it says, and Jesus went about in a circle preaching, he's being prophetic. Wow. Right. Uh, the Old Testament judges, they had a circuit. They were circuit people. Okay. So if they're going in a line, they are actually doing a specific purpose for a specific era that has beginning and ending. But if they go in a circle, they're acting prophetically and they're adding line upon line, precept upon precept, faith to faith, glory to glory, from everlasting unto everlasting, from deep unto deep, all these different terms that we have for time. But there's some other terms for time as well. There is, you can actually see redeemed time and unredeemed time all the way through the Bible. And, and you can actually see it in the language of the word of God. Like it will say, and when the time had passed, that is a picture of unredeemed time because it's things passing away. Or they will say, or when the time had come, that is a picture of redeemed time. And the scriptures that follow that are either going to be unredeemed or it's going to be, it's going to demonstrate a redemptive virtue of God or an unredemptive virtue of man, depending upon how that scripture starts off, because it's talking about what kind of time frame it's in. So I, I studied the last words of people. I don't know if you do that or not, but I'm a weirdo and I study the last words of famous people. I know that the last words of Frank Sinatra, who I love Frank Sinatra, is I'm losing it. I'm losing it. I'm losing it. Wow. All right, wow. I'm, not, I'm not saying that he's not redeemed. I'm saying he was experiencing unredeemed time. Because in a redeemed version of time, you're gaining it. You're gaining it. You're gaining it. You're gaining it. Okay, and so what we got to do, bro, is we got to we have to bring redemption into our time frames as stewards of our timeline. We are given a number of days. Right. That's right. And there is a wisdom to operate in that number of days. And you're expected to operate in that wisdom. You know, teach us, O oh Lord, to number our days that we might apply our hearts unto wisdom. Right. There is a supernatural wisdom about the days that you and I live in. And if you're out of sync with the timing it's an indication that you're cursed, okay? In Deuteronomy, uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, it says, it says, in the morning you will say, I wish it was evening, and in the evening you will say, I wish it was morning, because you will not obey the word of the Lord. What that means is when you're not walking in sync with God's word, you walk out of sync with timing. And when you're single, you wish you were married. When you're married, you wish you were single. When you don't have kids, you wish you had kids. When you do have kids, you wish you didn't. When they're in the house, you wish they were out of the house. When they're out of the house, you wish they were in the house. And you get everything you have ever wanted, but you never experience it because of the timing is off. Wow, wow. So redemption brings perfect timing. And perfect timing is everything. What was the That's curse amazing. that Jesus spoke upon Jerusalem? You missed your day of visitation. Hmm. He said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. He stood in the very place where David had stood with Absalom, Absalom, a thousand years, probably to the day, to the very day. When, 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 when King David prophetically cried over the loss of Absalom and cried out over Jerusalem. Okay, well, the grave of Absalom is right there at the, in the Kidron Valley at the base of the Mount of Olives. And Jesus was standing right there on the Mount of Olives at the base of, the, at the base of the Mount of Olives, crying out, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, just like David had a thousand years earlier. Son of peace, now he's saying city of peace, Right? And then he says, how I've sent you the prophets and you killed them. And he says, you have missed your day of visitation. You're out of sync. You're wow. out of sync and you're not going to bear any good fruit because you're out of sync. Wow. So when we learn to cooperate with God in the timing of things, when we learn to cooperate with God and to give him our times, when we learn to invite God Almighty into every single moment of our lives, we bring redemption into it. And when we bring redemption into it, we gain the kingdom in all of those places so instead good. of losing our lives in all those that places. That is so good.
You know what's fascinating to me is like two, two big uh, hot topics for you, two things that you're really, really passionate about, and then there are many, many things, but two things that stand out to me and how, again, it parallels with the culture is regarding space or the cosmos, the study of the heavens, and this idea of time. So you've been alluding to these two different topics uh, just, just in the last two days. I'm thinking about like the fascination right now within billionaires <laughs> Um, you have like Elon Musk, you have yep. like Peter Di- Di- Diamond, Di- Diamond is, or whatever yeah, you say, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. and all these di- different guys. Like, and like, there's this thing right now about like, let's get humanity into the cosmos, right? And, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's 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 a passion, it's a fascination, it's a fierce commitment. Like, there, the, we have a responsibility as a race to get up, mm-hmm. to get up where we belong, and that is in the heavens. And then you've got this parallel thing happening as well. Billions of dollars going into uh, this idea of making man immortal. That mortality should have never been a part of our original code. So how can we hack the human condition to unlock the original blueprint of, of the human thing? And so I, I find that really fascinating in that billions of dollars are being spent right now in our generation to unlock perhaps God's original blueprint for us as a race, but also, uh, uh, which is maybe what was happening at uh, Tower of Babel, of trying to use some sort of technology to unlock in order to access realms illegally and that kind of thing, right? (laughs) But then this is a passion of yours as far as redeeming our understanding, especially when it comes to the the sun, moon, stars, any sort of redemptive value uh, of looking at God's communication through the stars. Mm. Most Christians would say, careful, brother. No, careful. Yeah, well. Like, we can't. But so I I find it fascinating, man, just like hearing these things that you're passionate about, but also seeing that it's part, that there's something in the human condition right now that's saying, we're not just fascinated about this. We're, We're willing to spend billions of dollars in order to adv- advance our understanding of what's happening here. Yeah, well, the children of this world are wiser than the children of light, unfortunately. <laughs> and Jesus by, him, by himself said, <laughs> Jesus, by the way, said that himself. Who would say such a yeah, thing? Yeah, who would put down That's the offensive. people of God? Jesus that is would. offensive. I what know. would Jesus say? Well, you know, whenever people say, hey, man, you shouldn't look into these things. As a Christian, you shouldn't look into these things. Like, okay, if you're going to look at the heavens, and if you're, by the way, it's 222, 222. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Acts 222 is the only scripture in the entire Bible that has all three words, signs, miracles, and wonders. Hmm. The word wisdom is in the Bible 222 times. Wow. So let the wisdom of God be made manifest in signs, miracles, and wonders in Jesus' name. I'm sorry. I just couldn't help but notice the time. That's awesome. And I want to be in sync, okay? So (laughs) I'm constantly aware of that. (laughs) So good. But, you know, whenever whenever we I need to start watching the clock You do. I'll tell you, God will speak to you through that clock. It's 223, You know what that means. (laughs) I do. I know. I I don't have a clue what that means. I do. You do. (laughs) (laughs) Because I'm crazy. (laughs) That's awesome. uh, You're not crazy. You're passionate. (laughs) I am passionate. Come on. But whenever we look into, like, okay. You mentioned the Tower of Babel. Okay, everybody, if you go all the way back, and again, the language of God, where he says afterwards, he says, and now the people is one. Mm. And he wasn't misspeaking when he said that. He said, there's nothing that they can imagine to do that they can't accomplish. So I'm going to have to divide them up. Okay, and that's a huge word for the unity of the body of Jesus right now, which is a huge thing that God is after. God is looking for unity. And unity is not agreement. I, wow. I keep telling everybody that, well, we got to be in agreement. No, we don't. Wow. I've been married 32 years. I have a rock star wedding, and I hardly, I, I, I have a rock star marriage. I hardly ever agree with my wife. Wow. She's wow. a chick. Wow. Yeah. I'm only allowed one animal head in my house. I do not agree with that. She paints my house like it's a Mexican restaurant. It's purple and yellow and green. She does. Yeah. She's a trip. I don't agree with any of that, but I think she's cool. Yeah. Like, she's cool, man. She's a nut, but she's cool. I'm fascinated with her, right? But I'm not in agreement yeah, with yeah. her. Well, that whole that whole thing within the body of Jesus, well, brother, we have to be in agreement. Well, we're not going to be in agreement because wow, you ain't good. like me, and that's I ain't good. like you, and I'm not trying to be like you. That's so we good. need to be one. We need to be in covenant together. That's and so good. So, so going back to the Tower of Babel, that building was an astrological structure. Everybody thinks that it was a tower that the top was, that they were trying to get the top into heavens. That's not what it says. It says the top was as the heavens. It was astrological. It was as the heavens. Right. And it was like any modern, okay, if you go back like uh, a couple of years ago, Leanne and I went to Giza and I climbed the, 
the, uh, I climbed the, the, the Great Pyramid, which is illegal. You can get arrested for that, I discovered. So, but there was no way I was going to go to the pyramid without climbing it. I'm yeah. sorry. There's no way I'm climbing it. And so I climbed it. <laughs> Good thing you're fast. It caused, yeah, you know. <laughs> caused an international incident, which I'm sorry. <laughs> but <laughs> with that said, I, I, the thing about the, the Great Pyramid is that it's an astrological stru- structure. It tells you when the summer solstice is and tells you when the winter solstice is. It's an astrological structure. The Tower of Babel was exactly like that, and this is what it was. Its top was as the heavens, or in other words, it was astrological, and this is what they were going to do. Okay, so it had the 12 major signs, and by, there's, there's at least 360 constellations in the heavens, but there's only 12 that are a sign or that the ecliptic passes through or that the sun passes through. That's what makes it a sign. Okay, and there's 12 of those. You're like, well, wait a minute, that's the devil. No, nope. the Bible says in Genesis 1:14, the 14th verse of the Bible says, and God created the sun and the moon and the stars for signs, for seasons, and for days and for years. God created those for signs. The devil didn't create those for signs. The devil hijacked it, and we turned it over to him because we're a bunch of cowards. Okay, and I'm not. I'm right. just not afraid. Yeah, and so I'm totally, not, totally. I'm not, I'm not going to be like that. So whenever, whenever they did that, the, the top was as the heavens, and this is what they were going to do. It's Romans 1. When they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful, but they became vain in their imaginations and professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Okay, they became vain in their imaginations. In other words, they loved the knowledge so much, they felt godlike in knowing the knowledge, and they left God out of everything. Wow, wow, and then wow. they became vain in their imagination, they became fools. Fools means faithless. The fool has said in his heart wow, that there is no that's God. Right, that's right. So, so foolishness and faithlessness go hand in hand. So here's what they did. They had this astrological structure that was called the Tower of Babel, and then God divided them up. He turned them into races and cultures of the world so that they would not be able to identify with each other, would not be able to understand each other, and he compelled them to, I've got to go to China, I've got to go to North America, I've got to go to here, and when they went there, they built pyramids in all those places. That's why there's ancient pyramids all throughout the world because they're actually, actually from, from pre-Babylon. Okay, now the Babylonians got, because that's that's Babel, okay, which would turn into Babylon. The Babylonians got a hold of that same stuff, and they created this whole thing. They did not create the Zodiac. The Bible calls calls it the Maseroth in the book of Job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And probably Moses is the writer of Job. Most people think that Moses wrote the book of Job. Um, Maybe he did, maybe he did not. It is, Job is considered to be the oldest book in the Bible outside of the book of Enoch, but, which is not the Bible. But with all that said, um, with whenever, but in the book of Job, it mentions God, God asks him, he says, um, can you loose the bands of Orion? Can you loose the bands of Orion? Right. And he asks, he also says, can you, can you stop the influence of Pleiades? Mm-hmm. Okay. Even the word influence means the influence of the stars. It comes from the influence of the stars. A fluid, a powerful force coming from the stars. Like what why would God mention all that if that's the devil? Why would God say what what is okay, because because here's the deal. The deal is this those stories that are within the heaven give us the redemptive plan of the Father and say, I will redeem you. And before it was written in the Bible, it was written in the heavens. So God had programmed every single human being to walk outside, to look up and go, I know what that is. That clump of stars, if I connect the dots, that's actually a virgin woman who has a seed in her. Well, that's impossible. A virgin, a virgin woman cannot have a seed within her. Yet we know that sign is Virgo the Virgin. It is the first of 12. And the one that follows that is Libra, which says, okay, there will be a Messiah. Now, he, now, I, want to, now I want you to know there's a price that has to be paid, and he will be a redeemer. The one after that is Scorpio. What is this? He's going to have to take on death. The one that is after that is Sagittarius. What is this? He will rise up. He will take on death, and he will win. I can, wow. If you go wow. through all 12 wow. of those, you get to the 12th one, and it's Leo, which is the lion of the tribe of Judah coming back in Revelation, in Revelation chapter 22. Wow. Okay, so the heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day it utters speech. So daytime is for hearing God speak. Night unto night it reveals knowledge. Hmm. So God speaks differently at nighttime than he does in the daytime. Right on? Are you all yeah, tracking with me? Yeah. Okay. Don't worry so, about them. I'm with yeah, you. Okay, right. Thanks, yeah. man. 
So, so, like, so he's what, like, what? <laughs> <laughs> where am I? So, time. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he's actually, he's like, okay, I want you to see this and I want you to contemplate on some things. Okay. And I want you to see outside of your world at night. Wow. In the daytime, I want you to hear me speak to you inside of your world. At nighttime, I want you to see outside of your world and contemplate, contemplate things that are not in your world. Yeah. Okay, that's how God so designed good. things. Yeah. All right, for people to tell me today, which, by the way, it's lazy and it's faithless theology to tell me, don't be looking into those things because you're going to get in trouble. Here's what I say. You don't say that about sex. Yeah, they do. <laughs> right. You don't say that about money. Yeah. Christian's right. like, well, you might get in trouble if right. you spend money. Right, oh. right, right. Has anybody ever done anything terrible with money? Has anybody ever done anything terrible with sex? Right. Yes. Right. And yet, they'll be happily involved in all those things. Right. But don't be involved in glorifying God through the numerical values of things, which all those things are to glorify God or how the heavens declare, because we might get in trouble. Oh, that's so limp -wristed. And what's real is Jesus is coming back soon, and the heavens declare that. The heavens declare it. By the way, do you know what's do you know what's right out in front of the Great Pyramid? No. There's this giant statue out there, and I know that you know it's called the Sphinx. Oh, yeah. The Sphinx tells us where the story begins in the heavens and where the story ends in the heavens. Now, because wow. see, the witches and the warlocks who have hijacked the zodiac, they say that it begins at Aries and it ends at Pisces. Baloney. It does not. And the reason why they don't know where it begins and where they ends is because they're out of sync because they don't know the beginning and the end. Mm hmm you got to know Jesus to be able to understand this story. And if you don't know Jesus, you'll be out of sync. That's why nobody ever needs to heed the counsel of a witch in, their, in what their sign is because they're out of sync. And if you, if, you, if you prophesy out of sync, you prophesy a curse. Yeah, that's so good. They're out of sync. Don't listen to them. Okay, now I can tell you this. It does not begin with Aries and with Pisces. It begins with Virgo and it ends with Leo. You know how I know that? One of the ways I know that is because that's how the Bible is, Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation. But another way that I know that is because guarding the world-famous astrological structure known as the Great Pyramid is the Sphinx. And what is it? It is the head of the woman and the body of a lion. Mm. It tells us where the story begins and where the story ends. Mm. The word Sphinx means to join together. It means to join or to, or to unite. It's, it's, where, it's where you join the seasons together. Wow. Uh, mystery of the Sphinx solved, and I'm from Joshua, Texas. Yeah. You're welcome. I know That's all humanity amazing. has yeah. been waiting for me to do that. I didn't actually discover yeah, that. E.W. Bullinger, I read that in an E.W. Bullinger book, and then I went there, I went to Egypt, went and checked all that out, and was like, okay, right on. That's what it is. So I'm just saying this, that when it comes to time and when it comes to space and when it comes to the heavens, it's all screaming the, the same thing. Jesus is coming back soon. Yeah, that's right. That's not pie in the sky. And we cannot give up the return and our hope in the return of the glorious and imminent return of the Lord Jesus that's right. Christ. That's right. That's right. We're not waiting on the tribulation. We're waiting on Jesus to come yeah, back. That's right. We're looking that's right. for Jesus, our blessed hope. And there's a big part of the church, again, that does not have the courage or the faith or the stamina to look for Jesus. Yeah. And I want to tell you, man, I want to tell you, I'm looking for Jesus. It's so, all screaming the same thing. So let me ask you about this whole thing, like, you know, as far as the days of Noah and, and these days that we're coming into, right, you know, and life longevity and, and, and the whole thing of, like, man's lifetime being limited to 120 years and that already being undone, you know, that humans are living longer than that. And also just some of the stuff that, 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 that is coming out um, regarding, you know, life longevity and this, this whole thing. Um, what, what, what do you, you think is going to happen there? Do you think that, that uh, uh, do you think that, how, how far do you think that, that, that the Lord's going to allow that to go as far as, and do you think that that is in alignment with what he, what he wants for us? Or do you feel like that is almost like man's attempt to, to play God? I don't think there's anything wrong with people wanting to live as long as they want to live. And I don't think there's anything wrong with people wanting to have mastery in their life. I think it's kingdom. I don't think there's anything wrong with people wanting to be healthy and to go after and say, if I can live past 70 years and I will live past 70 years, if it's yeah. possible, I can do that. I'm all for that. I'm also here to tell you this, that the closer and closer and closer that we get towards the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, there's two things that are happening. One is men's hearts are filling them for fear for the things that they see coming up on the earth. And the other one is people are so full of hope that people are asking, why do you have so much hope? There's this dual thing that's happening 
at the same exact time. With that said, when it comes to technology, when it comes to genetics, and when it comes to human beings, and when it comes to all that, in the days of Noah, there is actually demonic manipulation yeah. in genetics. Mm -hmm. And it's all about to stop the Messiah from showing up. Wow. That's what it's all about. Wow. Okay? And so, uh, the, you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff that goes with this, but the verse for it in the Word of God is, again, it happened again even after the flood, mm. where it says, where the sons of God looked upon the daughters of men and found them fair, right? Yeah. Okay, and then there were Nephilim and giants within those days and all those kinds of things. Well, whenever God Almighty told the people of Israel, when they entered into the promised land, he said, now here's the deal, Pickle. I don't want you intermingling with any of these other people in there. And it wasn't because because God was a racist. It was because their seed was contaminated and it was contaminated, a bloodline was actually contaminated so that it would stop the promise of the Messiah. Wow. Okay, so and even today, if you hate a Jew, you're not going to hate a Jew because he's black or because he's white, because That's there right. are black Jews and there are white Jews. That's right. You're not going to hate him because of his politics, because Jews are either right wing of Attila the Hun or they're left wing of Gandhi, <laughs> right. right? Or right. you're not going to hate them because they're European or whatever. You're going to hate them because of their blood. Wow. People hate Jews because they hate the blood of Jews. Wow. Wow. How in the world wow. can you hate somebody because of their blood? It's, it's ridiculous. But there is a hatred in the midst of humanity towards the bloodline of the Jewish people. I saw the book of Matthew and the book of Luke starts off giving us the bloodline. And by the way, there's 77 generations from Adam to Jesus. It's listed in Matthew, right? Mm -hmm. And those 70, 77 is a, is a number that represents the church. And so Jesus was the 77th from Adam. Okay, and it's a number that represents the church. Even the word church is in the Bible 77 times. The term house of God is in the Bible 77 times, right? Yeah. It's a witness of the spirit of God being made manifest, 7-7. Seven, seven. Okay, all right, so with that said, in the days of, in, in mm -hmm. the days of Noah, not, not only did God preserve Noah in his house because he found them faithful, he preserved Noah in their house because their blood was not contaminated. Wow. 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 And that was a really, really, really big deal. Wow. It was a big deal because the promise of that seed, God had promised. So what does that mean? It means this. Hmm. It means that within, within genetics and within physical compounds and physical properties, there is a redemptive way that you can invade it and heaven invades it. And there's a non-redemptive way that you can invade it and hell invades it. Yeah, Amen. Absolutely. Or hell is made manifest. Yeah. I think the, the promise of the Antichrist, though there are many Antichrists, the Bible says that, and the Antichrist spirit is alive today. Absolutely. I don't know if the person of the Antichrist is alive and well today. I believe that there's a good chance that he possibly is. But I want to tell you, his bloodline is not a God bloodline. Wow. It's a contaminated bloodline. Wow. And so within us are the promises of Abraham going all the way back to Abraham. And when we tapped into the blood of Jesus, we tapped into a holy bloodline that literally infiltrated us. I don't have a Jewish bone in me. The only Jewish, the only Jew I've got in me is King Jesus. I've looked for it. I did the DNA <laughs> right. test. Did you? I just knew it was going to spike on Jew. <laughs> like, look, I'm a secret Jew. <laughs> I knew it. Like, I knew nothing. It. There ain't yeah. nothing but Italians and crazy people. And I don't know. <laughs> so I'm like, what the heck? I got Italians and Vikings and Brits and all these people that had never accomplished anything, right? So I'm like, okay. I just knew there was going to be this this Jew spike. Like, I knew it. <laughs> I knew it. Nope. Nothing. Not even a smidgen. So I'm like, dang. Well, I, I went before the Lord and to, I told the Lord, I said, Lord, I, I, I really, really thought, I kind of felt Jewish, man, because I have this huge, I love Israel and I love the Jewish people and I love all this. And the Lord told me, Troy, the blood of Jesus speaks better things than out of the blood of Abel. Wow. 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 And I was like, oh yeah, it sure does. No, I tapped into the righteous blood and I tapped into it and the blood of Jesus is the bloodline and I tap into that by faith. And that, by the way, is an important principle going back to this thing that has to do with time because, it, because you need to know that if you need the blood of the lamb applied to you, you can't physically go back through time and touch the blood of the lamb unless you do it by faith. That's right. Yeah, that's right. It's faith. That's right. That gives us access to the blood of the lamb That's that was right. applied on a physical cross in physical Israel physically 2,000 years back in a time realm. But we have access. We literally time travel. We, we, we literally just supersede time and distance because of faith. That's right. Again, another example of that. 
And I want to ask you about, and uh, I want to ask you about the um, the Jessica Rabbit Warden crazy prison. You're, you almost lost lost your life story. So I want to dive into that before. But before we do, before we do, <laughs> let's say I'm a 14 year old boy in your church, and uh, and I I call you up on the phone at the church, and I say. <laughs> Because this this has been a crazy year, right? Twenty twenty, we've had the we've had the co, you know, the COVID going around. We've had all we've had the riots, mm. all, all this stuff going. But I don't know. I, I'm sure you've seen this, like on the news. <laughs> you've got this thing flying through the air, like, and this was the um, the Pentagon has released videos this year. Uh, do you know what I'm talking about? Of of these unidentified. Flying objects. You're so and, from Seattle, and this man. is like, and this is this is this is been on the news. Like our That's government, our government is releasing it. footage of UFOs. Like okay. this isn't like the National Enquirer. I can't believe this you can ask me like, anything because you know I'm going to go off on this. <laughs> no, no, you're trying to get me in trouble. No, this you isn't coming from me. me. This isn't mail. coming from me. Okay, this is coming from a 14 year old boy in your church that says, Past, Pastor Troy, my mom and dad, they they don't they don't want to talk to me about this. Pastor Troy, are there UFOs? Are there aliens out? Th- what is this? I'm, Pastor Troy, tell me. If tomorrow, <laughs> if a spaceship landed in the Rose Garden tomorrow and wanted to meet our, our president, number one, I'd pray Trump was in a good mood. <laughs> That's what I'd pray. <laughs> and number two, I, wouldn't, I would not be able to wait to have my next church service. I couldn't wait. I'd be like, oh, to that's have an what extra I'm talking service. Yeah, let's said- go. I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready to have a move of God. Now, let me just, let me tell you, let me tell you what it's I mean by that. It's finally time for revival. <laughs> <laughs> what I mean by that is literally uh, my faith in King Jesus is unshakable with an understanding that there's tons of things I don't understand. Yeah. I love Jesus. Yeah, come and on. And Jesus is real and he's coming back. Is there stuff I don't understand? Oh, you bet. There's all kinds of stuff I don't understand. So with that said, you're like, well, wait a minute. Troy, wouldn't that mean different things? Well, yeah, I might have to rethink some things, but I'm probably, I wouldn't have to think a whole, rethink a whole lot of things. That's right. That's like, right. what are you talking about? It's like, what if we discover the world is actually round? Do you know that they used to actually kill people for thinking that? Wow, right. Look, right. we got a scripture. It says the four corners of the earth. Hello. Right. You're blaspheming right. if you think the world is round. <laughs> Idiots, right? <laughs> so I'm like, okay. So, so if if you stop me with something, I go, oh wow, I don't know how that works. It doesn't mean I don't know how the kingdom works. It means I don't know how that works. That's right. That's right. That's number one. And you just got to get over this thing of you think you got everything figured out. The second thing is this: the issue is not to me if they're aliens or if they're not aliens. Mm-hmm. Now you ask me a weird question, I'm going to tell you. It's great. The I issue to me it. is, are they of God's camp or not? Yeah. That's what I want to know. Yeah. Yeah. Because what if, what if there's a planet out there, and I'm not saying there is, what if there's a planet out there and God created a sinless person on it and they never sinned, and there's billions of people on that planet who have never, that, that planet's not fallen. What if, oh, I'm about to go, I could go off on all kinds this of This is awesome. Go, go. Oh, really? Go. You like this? Oh, this is amazing. Y'all are from Thank Seattle. You. Thank you for going there Listen, with me, Pastor Troy. You this go is... to hell for thinking this in Johnson <laughs> County, Texas. If they don't like it, they it's can leave. I mean, it's the internet. Just turn it off. If you don't like it, you can, you can turn it off. Dang Watch Skippy, my interview with someone else. <laughs> Thanks on. for dragging all Come this on. out of me. We're going to talk about Bigfoot I was trying to talk about smart stuff. Come on. I actually had some people thinking that guy's got his act together. Now they're like, "Damn, I'm out." This is awesome. This go there. No, so look here. Just because, all right. Let's say, let's say a UFO is is actually something that is alien. Just because there is something physical out there, doesn't mean that it is of God's camp or not of God's camp. I want to know uh, whose camp you with. Wow. They show up and don't know nothing about Jesus. I'm concerned about that. Yeah. If they're not part of the kingdom, I'm concerned about that. Yeah. If they show up and they're a part of the kingdom, I want to hear what they have to say, and I want to know what that's all about. You're like, oh, wait, are you talking about aliens? All right. Um, you ask me a question. Yeah, absolutely. You're 14 years old, <laughs> and here's what I'm going to tell you. Number one, if you see something and you don't understand it, you're not allowed to come to a faithless conclusion. And that's on you. Like, oh, 
oh my gosh, I swear, I saw something weird, therefore I'm questioning God. What? You can't do that. You, you have to, just because you see something or something happens that you don't have an understanding for, does not give you an excuse to come to a godless or a faithless conclusion. And this is a common, this is a common thing, Pastor Darren, that the devil does all the time. The devil is a lawyer. And he, wow. and he, and he works it's like true. this. He says, okay, uh, love is blind, yes or no? Yes or no? Is love blind? You, everybody just say yes. Yes. Uh, God is love, yes or no? Then Stevie Wonder is God. (laughs) Totally, totally, totally. Okay, you can go yes, yes. Oh, well, I I guess I have to say yes to that because I said yes to this, yes. Don't do that. That's a good point. You cannot do that. That's That's a a lawyer's trick. That's a good point. That's what a lawyer does. Isn't it true that so-and-so? Yes. Isn't it true that so-and-so? Then it has to be true this. No. Listen, we come to conclusions all the time that are fear-based That's right. and, insecurely, and insecurity-based because we come across stuff that we don't understand. So I'm not going to make fun of anybody if they saw some weird light. I saw a weird light in here last night that moved right across the stage. I saw it, and it was a blue light that moved right across the stage last night. Was it alien? It was angelic. I know for a fact it was angelic. Did anybody in here know the blue light? I don't know if anybody saw it last night or yeah. whatever. But Pastor I saw Tony it. saw it. Yeah. I saw it. Yeah. I saw it several yeah. different times. Yeah. I was like, oh, that's cool. Whatever yeah. that is. I don't know. I don't know exactly what it, that is. I believe with all my heart that's a ministering spirit. I mm-hmm. believe that that is normal in the kingdom. Yes. I just think it's not normal in most Christianity because most Christians need to be reached by King Jesus. Yeah, that's right. And so. Uh, a lot of Christian people are not kingdom people. So I don't know if that answers your question. But yeah. if aliens land at, if there, if there were such thing as aliens, if they landed at the White House tomorrow, I would still have, a, I would still be a drop dead, sold out Jesus Absolutely. freak. Absolutely. The Absolutely. moment they landed and 10 minutes after they landed. And if I could witness to them, if they need Jesus, I'm going to share Jesus with them. Yeah. Yeah, come on. I, I have a story about that, by the way. You do. Evangelizing was, aliens. Yes. Let's go there. I have Let's a story. Let's go deeper. Okay. Come on. I, I, I got a story about that. Yeah. Okay. Look, I, did you I ever see, see the, Mars Attacks? I did see yeah, Mars yeah. Attacks. Are okay. you for Jesus? <laughs> 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 okay. okay. So, so listen to this. If you think, oh, that's weird, wait till y'all hear this because you're going to love this. All right, when I, I got saved in 1986, I joined a Christian rock band, toured all over the place, and part of my stick, part of my spill that I would get up is I would tell everybody I was so on fire for Jesus. I actually did this in a radio interview when I was like 20 years old, and it stuck. And people started asking me, is it true that you said this? I went, yes, it's true. It was just awesome. And it was just a moment of brilliance on my part where someone asked me, Troy, I, I know you're famous for like going and preaching to prostitutes and you're famous for like you, you guys playing bars and y'all do all this stuff and you're like, you're, you're like fearless and you, you'll reach anybody for Jesus. If there's any place in the world that you've never been able to preach it would be your ultimate preach place, what would it be? And I just blurted out, the bar scene in Star Wars. <laughs> And I just blurted it out. Yeah, you got it. Weirdo. Yeah. I'm like, yay, that's what I'm talking about. And they were like, brilliant. So then all these reporters started asking me, man, when I was a kid, what, you know, they wanted me to say it. And yeah. I knew what they wanted me to say. And it just made me look cool. And I, it was funny. And I'd get up when I did my spill on stage and whatnot. I'd be talking about everybody. Man, take Jesus into the unknown. Don't be afraid. If I had a chance, I'd preach to the bar scene in Star Wars. Okay. Now, fast forward, uh, that, was, that was 86. Fast forward, 1994, 1995. My first cousin marries, my first cousin, mm-hmm. okay, marries Peter Mayhew, the guy who is Chewbacca the Wookiee. I have a cousin that's a Wookiee. And you, that you knew, you knew, you knew Chewbacca yeah. the Wookiee? I knew him very well. I've been... Close you should have that him. on your website. He like, just he just he just died this last year, oh, and wow. I was one of only two hundred people at his funeral. Really? Yeah, we had we had less than two hundred people at the funeral, oh. and uh, I was I was actually at the funeral, and it was crazy cool. I Having love to your Peter. voicemail. Like, hello, so, you. you <laughs> Yes. So I got to go to Star <laughs> sorry, Wars sorry, conventions. Jessica. I got to go to Star Wars conventions. I got to go to all the premieres. I got to do all that with Peter. That's incredible. Oh, that stupid. is so cool. All right. So. 
When a you just ranked runs, up with me, I'm right? Awesome. Like, I'm awesome. Yeah. Don't think I'm not yeah, awesome. You had me at Chewbacca. Listen, I'm, <laughs> dude, you have no idea what a bad motor scooter I am. So, so I get it. So, so the deal was when Attack of the Clones came out, um, he was not written in the script. Uh, Peter was not. Uh, Chewbacca was not supposed to be in really? the Attack of the really? Clones. And we all heard about it. So Open Door Church went, went into fasting and prayer for 30 days. Yeah, Al. That, uh, that they would rewrite the script and wow. that Chewbacca the Wookiee would be put into it that so that Peter awesome. would have a job. Because Peter hadn't had a job in 20-something years. He'd just done Star Wars conventions. And that was his, that was, you know, he's seven foot two. And, and he, it, he had to have this job. He had to have it. Wow. And so we literally fasted and prayed. And we used the scripture that the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. Wow. And uh, we prayed that God would change George Lucas's heart and put, and put Chewbacca back into it. So, you know, normal Christian stuff that churches do. So, <laughs> so he was rewritten into like, it. Pastor, why are we fasting was, again? Yeah, you know? Because we want Chewbacca <laughs> in Star Wars. <laughs> right. That's why. Right. It makes total sense to right. me, man. <laughs> So, and it made sense to my tribe. So we did. And, and God did it. And God touched his heart. And, 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 so awesome. and he rewrote the script. And he put, he, and George Lucas rewrote the script. And he put, he put Peter back in. Peter had a job. And it was like the family was like, oh, happy day, man. It was awesome. Okay, so, so Attack of the Clones comes out. And they have world premieres in several different places. They have one in L.A. They have one in Dallas. They have one in New York. They have one in Paris. They have one in London, right? Yeah. I got to go to the one in Dallas, and it was the first time that I had ever been to a digital seminar. I'd never seen a digital seminar before. I'd never, I'd never seen that before. And they had, it was a megaplex, too. They had like 30-something different places, right? So I'm like, okay, cool. Well, what happened is when you go to this, there's like the A list, the B list, the C list, the yeah. D list, and so on. And because I'm the cousin of Chewbacca, they're like in, – in, in like screen one, you got George Lucas and you got Harrison Ford and 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 Peters in there and all the main guys. And then in the second one, you got so and so so so. I am like in the theater that only has like fifty people in it. I'm like on the Z list. That's where I'm at, right? And then they all start at the same time. And so I'm sitting in there with my bride, and I'm getting ready to watch the premiere of Star Wars so awesome. on a digital screen, and yeah. I've never seen it before. And I'm like, wow. Ooh, I'm so excited. Yeah. And I'm like, this is so cool. And we're sitting there, and I'm like, uh, I'm talking and shooting the bull, and all these Brits are all sitting around me, right? And they're cracking up because I had a lot worse accent 20-some-odd years ago than I do now. I'm, this is the refined and cultured version right. of me. Right, right. But back in the day, I was quite the hillbilly. And... I'm talking, and they're just listening to me talking. They're just busting out laughing. They're like, God, we love Texas. And I'm like, well, y'all need to come out to my place, and we'll all be friends. Y'all come out, man, and I'll take you here, and I'll take you there. And I'm like, so they're like, so what are you doing here? What do you do in the movie? And I'm like, I don't do anything in the movie. I'm, so I'm, I'm, I'm Peter's cousin. And they're like, you're related to Peter? And I said, yeah. And they're like, we love Peter. And I said, yeah, I do too, man. He's just so cool. And his, his wife, Angie, is my cousin. And we all love each other. And it's just awesome. And they're like, well, that's great. I'm like, so what do you guys do? And they said, well, we don't do anything. We're out of business now to this whole digital thing. I'm like, well, what did you do before that? Well, we were puppeteers. You know, we're puppeteers. I'm like, what are you talking about? Well, basically, we're the bar scene in Star Wars. Wow. And I'm just sitting there. And, and I'm like, I love what? the reaction too, by the way. Like, I'm like, I was in the bar scene and started, oh! <laughs> well, I want you to know. So awesome. I want you to know. Revival just hit. No. <laughs> that was so good. A <laughs> fear. A fear came upon me because I was scared. My chair was going to fall out for money, and I was going to go straight to hell because I had been telling everybody for 20 years, if I had a chance, I would preach to the bar scene get in out. Star I know, Wars. Get out. And I'm like, this is the bar scene in Star Wars? <laughs> like, what are the odds of that? Oh. I'm like, oh, my gosh. And I look, and it's got a countdown, and it says, like, three minutes, 21 seconds. And I'm like, eh. I'm like, wait, Listen. Listen, you guys, listen, I'm a preacher and I love Jesus with all my heart. And they're like, yeah. And I said, and I, I play in a Christian rock band. I've been telling everybody for 20 some odd years if I ever had a chance, I'd share Jesus to the bar scene of Star Wars. And I'm sitting at the bar scene of Star Wars. And you guys got to let me share Jesus. I got a minute and 42 seconds left. And they're like, okay. And I was like, for God so loved the world. 
And and you gotta you gotta know this. And get, 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 all the way down to five seconds. And I went, whoo, I did it. And they all started clapping. And the lights went out and Star Wars started. So don't tell me you can't preach to aliens. That is incredible. That is so If they show up, I'm gonna preach Jesus to aliens. I have already preached to the bar scene in Star Wars. That is so awesome. In your face. Yeah, that is so awesome. And we're going to edit that and make that its own clip. The title will be <laughs> Preaching the Gospel to Aliens. And we're going to get like a million views. And that's awesome. I love that story. I that's love your story. story. You know, we, were down, we were downstairs. We were having lunch. And it was, and it was great. And, um, and it was about 1.50. And we were supposed to be starting our, our podcast at 2. And you started this phenomenal story. And I was just putting this awkward tension because on one hand this story was just so amazing and it just kept unfolding and unfolding and and these details and then finally about five minutes into it I said bro we got it we got to get upstairs and so I interrupt so I didn't even get to hear the end of the story and I asked you if you'd be willing I to forgot share. what the story was um I think it was about aliens no 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 oh okay so the, right. the 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 Jessica Rabbit oh Gordon. Jessica Rabbit yeah if, okay. So if you'd be willing to tell that I'd story. I'd be happy I mean, to. Because there were some to. things that you were quickly having to speed through that you couldn't get into the details of the time. But we've got time. So I'd love to, I'd love to hear that My story. My wife has an orphanage in Letitia, Columbia, which is on the Amazon River. We have orphanages all over the world. And <clears throat> this, this is a very, very, very special place. It's a very special place. Now, Letitia, Columbia is this little bitty tiny place that's reach, that reaches down into the Amazonas. And one side of Letitia is Brazil, across the river is per, is Peru, and okay. it's in Colombia. And so when we're down there, and we go down there every year, we take tons of people down there with us, do all kinds of work all up and down the Amazon River, and I love the Amazon. Amazon is just a hoot, and I'm a fisherman, and we go fishing the whole time we're down there and catch piranha and do all kinds of fun awesome. stuff. And so we're down there, and we were doing this. Well, there's a prison that is there, and... We're talking about a Colombian jungle prison. And I've been in prisons all over the world. I've been in prisons all over Africa, all over Mexico, all over Mexico, uh, all over Central America. But I want to tell you, this prison, this prison that is just outside of Leticia, Colombia, on the Amazon River is, is bad. I mean, it's not a good, <laughs> it's bad. So like Mexico, Mexico does not have a juvenile thing and I don't a lot of people don't know that if you're a kid in Central America and you get you, you go to prison with adults wow. they don't have a juvenile system wow. now they they have some local juvenile systems simply because there's Christian people involved in that and they love Jesus and they love kids and they'll work with the government and go I want that kid but most times like a nine-year-old boy gets caught stealing something he can go to prison and go to prison and there were 40 and 50 year old men and there's not a juvenile system that is in there. Another thing, too, that they do not have is women's prisons. So in this jungle prison that is designed to hold a couple of hundred people, there's about 800 people that's in there. And there is, I want to say, 60-some-odd women that are in the same general population with 600 men. And about wow. that, and, and about 100, 120 kids between the ages of seven and, you know, up until you're 18. That's terrible. Wow. And it's wow. bad. All in the same cells and, wow. All in the same place. And wow. you can imagine. And so we heard about this prison, and I was with an apostle from Brownsville, Texas, by the name of Gene Izagari. And Gene Izagari has been a friend of mine for a long time. He walks in signs, miracles, and wonders. Uh, there have been four times in my life I've seen somebody heal the blindness, complete, total blindness. And I was with Gene all four times. Wow. Uh, he's been with me to India and to Nepal. He's been with me all over the planet Earth, and I've tracked with him all over Mexico. And also had a good friend of mine named Jamie Cashin, and Jamie was with me. Jamie is a ninth degree black belt and runs around with Chuck Norris and all these guys. And he's a, he's a hoot, and he and I are childhood friends, and we grew up together. So he went on this missions trip with me, and I said, man, let's go in that prison. And so we, we found out about it. We put together 72 bags that had soap, and it had, it had all kinds of stuff in it. And so let's go in there, and let's find 72 prisoners and give it to them. And when we got up there, we put in for it. And number one, the culture of this prison was just so dark. And, and we were already, you know, we're waiting. They're like, well, you're going to have to wait and see the warden. 
And I'm like, okay. And just in talking to the guys, hey, man, I got some, because I always take bags for the, for the guards as well. and say, hey, I got you some special things. I got this, I brought this for you and for your family and all the guards come over. They're like, cool, cool. I'm like, yeah, we want to get in, man. And we want to, we want to preach the gospel of Jesus to these guys. You know, are you guys going to be cool? And I just, yeah, yeah, we'll let you in. But you got to talk to the warden. A few minutes later, this motorcycle comes pulling up and this woman who is, has the worst sexual spirit I have ever come across. She looks just like Jessica Rabbit. And I'm, without describing her, she looks just like Jessica Rabbit. And she takes off her helmet and she does her hair like this. And she is unbelievably beautiful and unbelievably sensual. And she's the warden. And when she got up, when she pulled up there on her motorcycle, she got off her motorcycle, and instantly all the guards were fearful. They were, they were terrified of this woman. Wow. And this woman had the worst spirit. Uh, as soon as I saw her, I went, that is a next-level demon-possessed woman right wow. there. Wow. Like, wowzers. And I thought, there is, no, there is no telling what's going on in this prison. And I didn't even know that there were women and children in that prison in the general population yet. I didn't even know that yet. And so she comes over and she's like, hola. And I said, hello, Jessica Rabbit. And I bless you. And we want to go in and we want to preach Jesus in here. And, and she's like, so you're Christians? Yeah. And she says in Spanish, that's cute. And she turns around and she goes, yeah, send them in there. And I knew the second... By the way they looked at her and the way she looked, yes, yeah, send them in there. I knew. Wow. She's, she's about to get us killed. Yeah. I knew she was saying, I knew what she was doing. I was like, hey, man, time out. Uh, we need to kind of rethink going in yeah. here. Can we rethink yeah. all this? And we were already just moving into the building. I'm like, oh, man, I'm praying to the Holy Spirit. We get in there with Gene, get in there with Jamie. And we get to this. We go through one door. They lock it behind us. Go through another door, lock it behind us. We're going past these rooms. We go past these rooms that have men and women in them. And I'm walking past these. They're like, oh, man, this is a dark, bad place. And then we get to this room, and it's a big room. And it's a room probably about half the size of your church. And they have these big bars and it's like a, it's, it, it doesn't have a roof. It's like a, it's kind of like a courtyard thing that has these tall walls, but it doesn't have a roof so that people can kind of experience the outside. And they open up the door and we go into this, we go into this room, just the three of us, and the guards slam the door behind us and they say in Spanish, you can have them. And I'm like, what do you say? What do you say? And Gene's like, Gene's like, he said, you can have them. And I turned around, and these guys were looking at us through the bars, and they started laughing their heads off at us, like, we're about to watch you guys get murdered. And instantly, these guys that were laying around, all that, they started moving kind of weird and started kind of going like this, and they started saying very terrible things. And I was like, rut row, this is not good. And right at the second... I, I, before I tell you how God intervened, I want you to know that several months before this, three Christians had come in, they had took them into that room, and they had raped and murdered those people to death. Now, nobody bothered to tell me this before I went into this prison, which would have been very helpful information, by the way. And I was like, you have got to be, I, I give you my word as a man of God that several months before us, the last three Christians that were in there, these guards, by order of that, of that woman, said, send them in there and let them kill them. Wow. And so we were the next guys. And we had no idea what we were walking into. We didn't have a clue. They all started moving forward to kill us. Uh, Jamie Cashin said, let's get in this corner, and we're just going to fight out of this corner. And I'm like, okay, I'm behind you, man. Let's go. And I, I thought, this is it. We're fixing to get murdered and killed in this prison on the Amazon River. And all of a sudden, Gene Izaguerra said, the power of God is in this place. And he yelled that. And instantly, there was like, like a boom, like a sound that happened in that room that I can't really explain. But it was just like a boom. There was a, 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 an atmosphere shift and change in the room. And gold showed up on everybody. 
And Gene told him, you need to sit down. You need to be quiet. God is in this place, and he ain't playing with you. Wow. And he started yelling at him, and they all, everybody sit down, and they just started going, what's going on? What's going on? What's going on? I, I'm just standing up against the wall. I'd never seen anything like this. I'd never experienced anything like this before. And Gene's like, so God sends us in here, and you guys going to murder us and kill us? That's what you think you're going to do? You're not going to murder us and kill us. The Spirit of the living God has sent, us, has sent us down here. And the spirit that comes from that Jezebel warden, and we could see her. Wow. We, we could see her, and the guards looking They're through, they were watching. all going to be They're entertained watching. by how we were about to be murdered. And he's like, let me tell you something. God's taken away the authority of that Jezebel warden right mm. there. And I'll tell you something. All of you guards, you better get ready to repent because the Spirit of the Lord is moving this place. And he's speaking in Spanish. And God began to move. And for two hours, we prayed and prophesied to these people. And God gave us a word for every single person that was in that place. Every single one of those guys either gave their heart to Jesus or said, I, I want to surrender to God in some way or another. The guards were crying. The guards were terrified of us. The guards were like, we're sorry. We apologize. We're wow. sorry we did that. Our boss made us do that. We would, we're sorry. We didn't know. We didn't know. We didn't know. Wow. I can tell you that uh, one guy came up with this knife that was about this big, and he came up to Jamie, my friend, and uh, Jamie, Jamie follows me on everything I do because he stalks me, you know. <laughs> and so he's probably watching this. But he came right up to and he put it in because we hugged every single one of those guys. Those guys lined wow. up and we hugged wow. every single wow. one of them. And he put this thing in his, he, he put this thing in Jamie's stomach and said, this was what I was going to kill you guys with and gave it to him. Wow. Yeah, the Spirit of God moved in a way that, that, the, the spirit of murder in that prison was overwhelmed by the holiness of God in a second. It's incredible. And I learned from that. I've, I've since been in that prison several times. We, we've gone back several times. And I learned from that experience that no matter what mess is going on, because I want to tell you, I can't imagine anything worse than that. No. I, I cannot tell you how scary it was. And wow. I can't tell you how sickening and horrible it was. It's like, okay, this is not good. At all. And I can just remember going, okay, wow, wow, man, okay, okay, here we go. And just kind of settling into the reality of this is how we're going to be murdered, and this is what's going to happen today. And all of a sudden, God changing it with his holiness. Changing the whole momentum, changing the atmosphere of the room, changing the attitude of everybody there, changing the reality of what was going on from one thing to another thing in an instant, in a second, and nobody questioned it. Nobody went, hey, wait a minute. We're, we're, nobody did that. Everybody like, we're, 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 all, we're done. We're ch-. And, and I, I can't explain it. It was just a boom. So we went back the next year, and I invited a bunch of my team to go with me. <laughs> like, come into this prison. We nearly You're going to love this place. You're going to love yeah. it. And by the way, uh, the Lord did a great work and got that, Jezebel Rabbit out of there. Wow. And wow. she was Come gone. On. We went back Come the on. next we went back the next year, talked to the new warden, said, You're not gonna try and kill us, sorry, because the last warden <laughs> tried to kill us. And he's like, No, I heard about you. And by the way, we put together 72 of those bags and there were 72 guys in that room. Wow. And there was exactly the exact number of bags that we had brought in there. The Lord That's had a incredible. gift for every single one of those yeah. guys. So we go back the next year and I took I took Jerry with me, my executive pastor. And we told him, he's like, man, I ain't never seen no gold or nothing like that. I don't know if I ever be able to see any gold or anything like that. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like you're going to see. You'll see, man. So we go down there, and the bottom line is we get in this stairwell, and it's still a bad prison. And there's still men and women and kids in this place. And it's still a very sad, very dark place. But there is a Christian faction in there now wow. from the year before. A wow. bunch of Jesus freaks. And there was so many, the entire prison wanted to see us. And so they couldn't all meet in that courtroom. So what they did is there was a stairwell, a big giant stairwell that was like four stories. And they put us at the bottom of the stairwell and everybody hung out in this, you know, it was crazy cool. And so we're down there like, hey guys, you know, hello ladies. And we're like, here we go, let's do this. And they were all there and we couldn't get their attention because they were all talking. And they were all talking, it was super loud in this room. 
And we're like, hey, hey. And I was kind of listening. Hey, guys, everybody pop down and we're going to start talking to you guys. And they wouldn't. And all of a sudden, a hush, just hush and gold was all over everybody. And I'm like, Jerry, you seeing this? He's like, I didn't think I would ever see this, man. He's like, what is this? I don't know what it is. It's the tangible presence of God that is manifest in something that looks like gold. I don't know why God would do that. I have no explanation for it. But I want to tell you, it's got everybody's attention. They're being quiet. Let's reach them off for Jesus. There were, there were men prostitutes in that prison that looked like women that were crying and saying, I feel the love of the Father towards me. There were, it, there were, it was incredible acts of redemption were taking place in this stairwell while we were there. That's amazing. So I'm just, I, I would just say this about just the thing that I learned from that miracle is how that if you really go after the holiness and the presence of God, yes. how that the presence of God and the holiness of God can change an atmosphere in a moment and change the reality of something into a completely different reality. And I've seen that happen. That's incredible. What an amazing story. Thank you so much for sharing. So welcome, that. man. Wow. Thank you. Wow. How, uh, so how long have you been pastoring now? You, you planted the church. You planted yeah, it. Yeah, we're having our 25th anniversary uh, this in three weeks. We're having our 30th anniversary. Thanks, man. Yeah, that, that's Thanks. amazing. We're having our 30th anniversary of the food bank this weekend. Okay. Because we, we were born breach. We started the food bank and then we started the church. <laughs> that's awesome. That's, so, so, everything I do is preach. It so makes sense to me. Pastoring for actual 20, for 25 for years. For 25 the years, food bank yeah. for 30. And now, so how has pastoring changed in 2020? Yeah. Well, uh, the wineskin of how you do ministry has changed, but pastoring hasn't. You know, leading yeah. and feeding and loving people and, and encouraging people and all of that. But, yeah, no, we've definitely had our challenges as the whole entire world has had tremendous challenges in all that. I, I, I like the, Sorry, I'll be more specific. No, Does no. it feel like the same congregation? Or do you feel like there was almost like, a, like, a, like, almost like an identity shift that took place because of just almost the trauma of the year, if that makes sense. Man, I want to I want to tell you, we are a very strange exception to the rule, and and I I do not say that in a prideful way at all. I'm I'm saying that we never have an open seat in our church. It's amazing. I we never. I, everybody that comes to our church says we forget how the world is when we're among you guys, That's and it's amazing. because we respond to crisis. We have always responded to crisis. Immediate response to crisis awesome. is a big part of our niche and how we carry the presence of the Lord. Even though we don't know what we're doing half the time, we still are always ready to respond. We want to answer evil with the goodness of God. Yeah, come on. That's what we want to do. Yeah. And so as soon as this thing hit, our church just doubled. It didn't go away. It doubled. And and whenever in Texas, when we were not allowed, there was a short time where we, where we were not allowed to gather, we just met in the parking lot. We would have thousands of people show up in the parking lot. And then we just moved our food outreaches from from the food bank. And that's when the media the, showed up. I yeah, know. That's uh, Fox, right. yeah. Fox News showed yeah, up. Yeah, we were on Fox. We had national. Yeah. We were on Fox News. Yeah, we were on amazing. national news, which was crazy cool. That's funny. I forgot about that. Yeah, man. yeah. Yeah, that's right. No, that was a big day for us. And, but, but again, I do not say this in a prideful way because there's so many ways we don't have our acts together that so many churches do have their acts together. But one way that we have our act together is we, we hate fear. We hate fear. I hate the smell of fear. I hate it. There's no hope in fear. So when all this stuff started hitting the fan, all the poo started hitting the fan, and like, like, and everything's, and, and all the projections, and everybody started freaking out. When you started hearing about that, what 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 was that like? What for you? For me, number one, yeah, there's a part of it that's very scary for me because I mean we have kids all over the world, and in the places where our kids are, there's no medical facilities except for our medical clinics that are there, mm -hmm. and we're looking at going. How can I get respirators there if we have to have respirators? Wow. And how can I do this? I mean we're gearing up. Wow. Because, because we're not stupid. I mean, wow. like, hey, man, if this is real, this is real. But I also know this, that where sin does abound, grace does much more abound. So I'm like, I bet you there's going to be a huge healing revival this year. I bet that's <laughs> what's going to happen. Yeah. I bet you. I bet you there's an outpouring of security this year in the midst of all this great insecurity. I bet you 
anything, there's a great outpouring of hope and courage in the midst of all this fear and panic. I bet you that's what's happening. I want to be on that train. How do I do that and how do I lead people into that? And I've just been, Pastor Darren, I've just been very honest, as honest as I can possibly be and just go, look, I don't like this. This is scary. We're having to change how we do things. Let's not care how we have to change to do things. Let's just be Jesus. Let's be the hands and feet of Jesus. Let's be fearless. I, I don't have answers to this. I don't have answers sure, to that, but sure. I do have answers for this. I know why we need to have hope and I know why I just start going off on what are these things that we do know? Who do we need to be and how can we be those people? And let's do that. That's awesome. Let me ask you, just being a young, a, well, young age, I was a young pastor at one point in time. How old are you? How old are you? 38. I have socks older than you. <laughs> That's what James Maloney said when he saw me. It's ridiculous. I got, I got socks older than you, son. <laughs> I'm wearing them. Right yeah. <laughs> when all this started to happen. You want to see my socks, yeah. by the way? You got yeah. to see my socks. Hang on a second. Watch this. Hang on. Let's go and put it on Hang top on. of the table. These yeah. are my grandkids. <laughs> Those are my grandbabies. That's so cute. <laughs> I just thought I'd share that with sort of. you. Yeah. yeah. You want to see my socks? Yeah, what do you got? No, just, no you don't want to see I want to see them. What do you no, got? I'm not wearing Oh. <laughs> you take off your shoe and a mushroom falls out. <laughs> That's right. You have no That's personal right. hygiene whatsoever. <laughs> um, all right. When all this stuff started happening, it, like, and people, and, and, and there was, like, there was all this kind of, like, reaction response, right? Immediately things started getting, um, I am wearing socks. I'm not, I'm not one of them. Don't judge. All right. So, um. I'm looking now. I don't believe you have on they're, socks. They're the, no, they're the no, no show, you know. Let me see them. But they're pretty plain, man. They're just black. Do you like have like a Jurassic Park toenail hidden underneath that thing, like one of those giant <laughs> got a, got a tattoo on that big one? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, you yeah. think those are Thank legit. Thank God there's no holes. That, see, that's, that's what I was that's a little what worried about. Because I won't throw them away. Oh, I wouldn't have made fun and, of you. <laughs> Andrea is like, you need to throw those away. I'm I got like, my no grandkids on my socks today, logo man. on it. I'm a know? sock guy. I have wild socks. People from all over the world give me crazy socks. And I love crazy. Do you have any socks with your with your face on them? Mm -mm. <laughs> I'll, have to, I'll have to get you some. I need that. Yeah. Would you get me that for Christmas? <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, that's not narcissistic at all. So, <laughs> anyways, like our journey, our, <laughs> our journey here, right? Like, was really like wanting to just be a good Christians, good missionaries, if you will. Mm -hmm. Wanting to, of course, have wisdom, right? And so we went online for twelve weeks, which was which was crazy. Um, it's great that you guys could do that. And we, we basically created a television show because I didn't want to have to watch a church service. I, I, don't wa I, don't, I don't watch a lot of church services online. I understand a lot of people do. Um, I don't get the, I, I'm just being honest. I, I know, oh, okay, but it. I'm not a big guy of like, of praise and worship from my couch. I, 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 ha I don't, okay. So I didn't want to okay. make my kids sit on a couch and watch a two hour service. I didn't want to make them do that. I didn't want to make myself do that. So, so, so you changed your whole nine We yards. did it. We created a television show that was like Saturday awesome. Night Live meets Sesame Street. And, and it was awesome. a lot of fun. Got a lot of attention or whatever. And that went for 12 weeks. And then I was finally like, I told our board, and they can vouch for this, um, I'd rather be arrested and go to jail than to, to do another production. Like, like I was just tapped 30 hours of editing for one service, yep. you know, every weekend. Yep. Going to bed at 2 a.m. on Saturday night before the yep. Sunday morning. I was done. We uh, moved out into a tent. Again, because the governor said, like, we've got a gorgeous facility here. Great airflow. We can do social distancing, all this. But instead, we had to go worship in a tent mm -hmm. where we were crammed together in the pouring rain. We actually had uh, rain and wind almost every Sunday which isn't that healthy, you know, being out in the cold, shivering, trying to worship Jesus as a church community. So we were out there for four weeks. Again, just trying to be good Christians, trying to obey the rules, sure. trying to. Sure. And as the rules kept changing and as the, the, the wind kept, first of all, no church until we reached the curve, uh, you know, the, the, the old co COVID curve. And then we reached the curve and they said, now no church until people quit dying. So the the wind the wind changed yeah. and it just kept it just, just kept, kept pushing on and it just kept getting more and more absurd uh, until fi finally we just kind of came to the point where it was like all right we're God bless God bless you know the governor um, but we're gonna need to be adults here we're gonna need to practice wisdom we're gonna need to pray obey have some conversations as leaders and so there is there is still this tension right now 
um, between, um, and I know there's this tension right now between those that are like, okay, we're done. And we're going to be wise, and we're going to, and we're, we're, but we're going, to, we're going to move forward, and we're going to advance. And, and, and then there's this other tension saying, well, then you're, you're rebellious because you're not submitting to the, the, to the leaders that God has established um, within the land. And also, the, being an election year, there's this, there's this low-level current of absurdity and insanity that in certain states wants to govern and dictate how church is going to take place. So as a young leader, if you rail against that absurdity, there's this place where you could be considered a rebel when for the entire year we've been trying to be good Christian missionaries and walk something out with a, with a great, you know. With, 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 with. So um, there is this, like, thing within the church right now of, like, you know, that, that servant leadership looks like compliance to, 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 to local government and state government. And yet there's also leaders that don't even necessarily believe in the moving of the Holy Spirit today that are taking a more radical and perhaps even like book of Acts stance than even, you know, churches that are filled with the Holy Spirit. Like this whole thing of like our, where's our boldness, where's our courage, what's allowed, what is rebellious and what is, I don't think I have a rebellious spirit. And yet it's kind of like we're like, we're done, you know. And so um, uh, you've been doing this, you know, longer than myself. And you recognize this tension and you brought this charge last night as far as the test that you see the church in right now. And I was wondering if you could, if you could speak into that, not just to people, but maybe if there are any sort of leaders that are caught in the middle right now. They're caught in this tension. They don't want to be seen as an outlaw. They don't want to be seen as a rebel. They've got a heart to serve Jesus, to serve people. They want to be a good, a good witness. They want to be a relevant you know, missionary to the culture, and yet they feel stuck in the middle between um, what, do, what do I do? Could you speak into that? No. Well, thank you so much for joining us. This has been amazing. I'd rather talk about aliens. <laughs> man, dude, you do a hard show, man. I mean, do you not want me to have any friends at all? You just, I'm going to be a metal detector for the rest of my life. I have no friends. I have no friends whatsoever. All right. Um, I'll be your friend. Will you? Will you be my friend? Absolutely. All right. Absolutely. Let me move my leg. All right. So... So let me let me throw this out there. Let me and let me and let me say this very very humbly. First of all, I, I you guys have had challenges that we in Texas have not had, and I'm, I commend you for how you've handled it. I, I I have friends in California. I mean, you know, the People's Republic of California, and that I mean, they're not allowed to sing. Oh, we're going to find out if you're singing, and we're going to bust you, and you're going to go to jail, or you're going to pay a twenty thousand dollar fine per pastor. Yeah, in the. In the United States yeah. of America, not in North Korea, in the United States mm -hmm. of America. And this we're going to do in the name of our safety. And That's we're right. going to call that safety. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you a couple of things that, <laughs> I'm going to, that is going to be controversial. And I want, but I want to also just say this, man. I recognize that, that people have challenges in different states that I do not have. And I don't want to act like I would handle those things any better. Sure. Because I don't know how I would handle those things. I, I really and truly don't. I, I have been a part of the underground church. I've been all over uh, Cuba, one end of Cuba, the other end. I spent three weeks there one time meeting with the underground church and three weeks meeting with the above ground church. And I want to tell you, the underground church and the above ground church hate each other in Cuba. Really? For the same thing we're talking about. Really? Yeah. Wow. And if you go and if you share the gospel in communist nations, as I do throughout the world, the underground church and the above church hate each other. They hate each other's guts. That's fascinating. Wow. And they're like, well, here's the deal. All you got to do is comply with the government and let the, and let the communists come in and let them have the pulpit and let them say that, that Father Fidel is good and socialism is good. And all you have to do is report to the government all the people that show up for baptism and show up. And if anybody visits, you have to report that. But listen, our kids don't disappear. Our kids don't disappear, and we don't go through all the hell that the underground church goes through, and we can actually evangelize, and we can do things. Wow. And I'm like, okay. Like, okay, wow. The underground church is simply their sellouts. They're sellouts, and we, they make us sick, 
and we are suffering. They do not support us. They turn us in. They do this. They do that. And I saw both sides of that when I was in Cuba in an incredible way. And I've seen it. I've seen it throughout the world in different ways. And now I'm seeing it right here in the United States. That's and I'm amazing. like going, wow. That's amazing. Wow. Here it is. I've seen it here. I can, I can tell you that, that just talking as an adult, as a 53-year-old man that grew up in the United States of America and is a Christian, I can tell you that, that no matter what anybody says, the reality of the situation is I have a First Amendment right and I have a commandment from God. I have those two things. Mm -hmm. And just because you don't feel like I don't have that doesn't mean I don't have that. I might have to, I might have to go against you in court. I might have to debate you in the, uh, the halls of public opinion. I have to, but what's real is I have a First Amendment right and I have a commandment from God and I'm going to act on those things. I might have to change how I act on those things. And I don't want to be stupid in how I do things just for the sake of being rebellious or being heinous in some way. With that said, we, the, the church of Jesus Christ is getting a big dose of what we have been dishing out, and I'm going to tell you how. <laughs> Man, why do you got to ask me all this hard stuff? And it works like this. We have not done, we have not done missions. That's right. We have not done, we have not reached out into hard places in the community. And we've not done it in the name of responsibility and safety. It's true. We have not done food outreaches. We've not fed people. We've not blessed people. We've not reached out to prostitutes, to homosexuals, to, to radical socialists in the name of responsibility and in the name of safety. Wow. wow. We have messed with our boards. And by the way, us pastors, we have had to deal not with the church board. That's crazy. But with the most crazy person that's on the church board that everybody is afraid of. And we've yielded our First Amendment rights, and we've yielded our commandments from God over to the meanest personality on the board who screams and hollers responsibility and safety. And now we're all getting a big dose of that. Wow. I mean, we're all getting a dose of what we have been dishing out to the United States for years and years and years, watched our country go to hell because, hey, man, we need to be responsible, and it's not safe to do that. I mean, how can we, I've, I've wow. gone through church wow. splits wow. at wow. Open Door. This is a manifestation of wow. what we've dished out. Wow. And I, I can tell you, I have had church splits at Open Door Church. The last one was in 2011, and it was horrible on this. Hey, Troy's crazy because he spends every dime of church money on people who will never go to our church. We are never going to have a nice building. We're never going to have this. We're never going to have that. And he spends all of our money on people that we will never go to this church. And it's irresponsible. Not only is it irresponsible, but he's actually risking the lives of our teenagers by taking them into ghettos. Really? They're risking the lives of our kids and taking them into some place, into non-safe places in Mexico and in Uganda and in India. And that's risking the lives of our kids. And in the name of safety and in the name of responsibility, we need to, we need to shut Troy down. So now the government is coming to the church and saying, in the name of responsibility, in the name of safety, you're not allowed to gather. You're not allowed to worship God. And I, I recognize it, and I'm like, wow, 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 wow. I would say, I would say this, that um, whenever peace and safety are our highest priorities, we're not a part of God's camp. And when everybody's like, well, uh, we have to have peace with all the people that are hostile against us, and we have to be safe, you're not a part of God's camp. The Bible says that when they say peace and safety, the sudden destruction will come upon them wow. as a thief in the night. Wow. Do you know the United Nations last year, the United Nations, their theme for the year was peace and safety for the year 2020. Really? Peace and safety. Wow. Here it is. The, the literal theme of the year is peace and safety. And so it is now throughout the whole world. In the name of peace and safety, you cannot advance the kingdom. And people will comply to that. Because peace and safety makes sense to them. Because instead of being uh, battleships, we're cruise ships. And we don't know how to respond to things. And I would just, I would just say that everybody needs to. Here, here's what I would ask you, Pastor Darren. 
if you said tomorrow, okay, this is the deal. Hey, we're just going to continue to shut down until the year 2021, which I'm telling you, some of the greatest churches in America have decided that. We're not even going to try and do any form of church. We're just going to give up on the year 2020. We're going to wipe it all out, and we'll just wait until next year. As if they have that choice, as if their church is their church, because their church belongs to King Jesus. It doesn't belong to them. Sure. It's the church of Jesus Christ. It's not the church of Troy Brewer. Yeah. And you're supposed to steward that thing, and it's supposed to look like heaven, and it's not supposed to look like hell. And your region is supposed to look like heaven, and you're supposed to be representing the name of King Jesus. But let's just say, let's just say that that if you decided and just said, "Hey, look, here's what we're going to do. We're just going to just we're just going to back off. We're just going to just shut everything down for a little while because here's what's real is we need to try and get along with the people that are mad at us, and we can't take a chance. We cannot take a chance upon those people being hostile against us, and quite frankly, it's kind of dangerous for us to gather anyway. I, I have to just, just tell you if, you, if you announce to the church, and if your church is okay with that, do you want a church full of people that's like that? Hmm. Because that's all you're going to get. Right. And then you're going to wonder why your community is going to hell, why your church is failing, sure, sure. why the city of Seattle is not being reached, why there's not signs, miracles, and wonders, because that's the church that you have built. Right. And that's the kind of people that you are shepherding and you are feeding and you're calling for. I'm not calling for those people. That's right. That's right. That's right. I don't give a rip if those people ever show up at my place. Wow. I'm looking for people who are not afraid. I'm looking for people who are full of hope. I'm looking for people who believe that Jesus is the answer. I'm not looking for just troublemakers in the sense of we're here to cause trouble, but know of a certainty. We're here to cause trouble. <laughs> we are. <laughs> we are here to cause trouble. Right. We are here to confront evil with goodness. That's right. And there is a real confrontation that is involved in that. And I don't enjoy, I thank God for the mayor of my city who has put up with us because I'm sure he's had difficulty putting up with us. And I thank God for him. I, I pray for him every day That's awesome. uh, and pray for his administration every day because I know he's looked over at us and seen the thousands of people gathering over there and shaking his head and just went, wow, man, these guys, I don't know what to do with these people. Well, what are you going to do with us feeding 3,000 people a week in this city? Wow, that's right. That's right. What are you going to do with that? That's right. Just shut that down. In, in in an election year, <laughs> right? You know what do you anyway? I'm about to start talking about all the stuff that we do. Okay, absolutely. And Go I, for it. I, so if we don't, if we that's incredible. If we if if again if if our highest value as leadership is comfort and safety, all in the name of responsibility, all you're going to have is a congregation full of people say, then in the name of Jesus, we should never do anything. And there's already enough of those people in, in churches. Yeah, it's true. It's true. I think it was John Wimber that would spell faith, R-I-S-K. It's mm, good, man. You know, and sometimes we have to wonder if what our faith is, if there's no risk in it. Man, I, I, everything in the kingdom is risky. You know, Jesus says, I send you out as lambs among wolves. He doesn't say, and I send thee forward in hazmat suits. <laughs> he says, I send you out as lambs among wolves. <laughs> Going out <Yeah>. now. <laughs> exactly. And I, I just, I just, you know what really shock, shocks me is not that people have problems trying to figure this out, is how quickly the church will fold That's when right. it's under pressure. That's right. And I'm actually shocked at that. I'm like, wow. In, in, in the city where I'm at, there are four mega churches. Our church has been the only church that has been open through this whole thing. And it's totally legal to be open. Totally legal. I mean, there's no legal reason for us not to gather. Zero. You, but we're just afraid that somebody might be mad at us. Why would we care if somebody was mad at us for worshiping Jesus or for feeding people or for helping people or crying out to God? Why would we care? I don't know. Do you have a pulse on how on how the church in America is doing? Right I, on one hand, uh, uh, I, have a, I have a good friend that says the church is being ravaged right now because of COVID nineteen. On the other hand, I have a good friend that says uh, that every everyone they talk to, the church is being radically blessed mm -hmm. this year. Um, do you have any sort of pulse from your perspective yeah. as far as how the greater church? And do you feel like we're getting just beat this it's year? Three three three. By the way, three three three. Call upon me, Jeremiah 33, 3, and I will Come call on. you. Come on. And I will show you great and mighty things that you know not of. Take I, it, take it, take it, take it. <laughs> I, can, I can say this to you that it is very much a tale of two cities. It is the best of times and it is the worst of times. 
in both at the same exact time. Um, I have a good friend of mine that pastors a certain denominational church in, in the state of Texas. It is a world famous denomination in the state of Texas since January the 1st, 44% of their churches in the entire denomination in the entire state of Texas is done over voted <gasps> in one year, 44%. Wow. 44% in one year is over. The only, like, are you kidding me? There's only 66 out of 100 churches that are still standing. 44 of them are gone. And it's like, are you kidding me? What wow, happened? Wow. And, and I'm like, oh, my gosh. I can also tell you at the same exact time, I can also tell you that the huge majority of people that were in church that were a part of church before COVID, they have learned to live without church, and they're not going to come back. It's true. I'm, I'm just telling you, like, no, they got to come back. They're not coming back. It's true. They're not, they're not coming back. They don't, they don't need it. Mm -hmm. I can tell you with that said that the wineskin has been changed and there is a new direction that the power and the spirit of the Lord is going. And there is a new wine that is being poured out that King Jesus is not willing to waste. Come That's on. why there has come been on. a mandatory wineskin change. Yeah, come on. And I can tell you that what God is doing in and through and for and with our churches is exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think if we do not bail. And we had better pass this test. That's true. Yeah, come on. Now, we cannot judge the success of our ministry, the success of our ministry by how much money is coming in. Um, that scares me. That's very Laodicean. Actually, we're rich when actually you're poor. What good is it to have money coming in if you're not having transformation or signs, wow. miracles, and wow. wonders wow. or salvations? So using finances as the win in and of itself. Okay, I understand that that's necessary. Believe me, I understand. Sure. It, it costs us millions of dollars to do what we sure, do. Sure, sure. With that said, and, and I know j just in saying that, there's going to be a criticism. Well, you know, you save 2,000 girls a year out of sexual slavery and feed them and house them and take care of their babies, which out of the 2,000 girls, there's more than 6,000 babies that are with them that we have to take care of. And you see if that doesn't cost you money. No, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that offends people. But, no, we're looking for millions of dollars to come in. With that said, the win is not the money that comes in. The win is the fruit that is made manifest in that. And here's the deal. If you've been shut down since February and you're not even willing to open until January next year, even look at open, you have no judge of fruit whatsoever, but you're saying, we're fine. Everything's good. We're fine. That's Laodicean. And Jesus is outside and says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And if any man were hear my voice, I will come in and we will be a family again. We'll sup together. That's right. right? That's right. But he's on the outside trying to get back into his own church. And I think that this thing has exposed us as a church of if Jesus is welcome in our midst or if he's not welcome in our midst. That's right. And I think that that's where we judge our success or not. That's so good. It's so good. Now, Pastor Troy, let's say that my family and I, just switching up gears, you've been talking this whole week, uh, this whole week, but the last two days, about what you guys are doing with rescuing children from sex trafficking and rescuing refugees and actually buying slaves and, and purchasing their freedom. Um, let's say that my, fam my family and I wanted to actually purchase somebody out of slavery. Uh, how, much would that, how much would that cost, and how would we, how would we do that um, by working with, with your ministry? Well, let me just say this. It would be illegal for you to do that. And let's just kind of just stop. Let's just talk about that. All right, if you're not going to gather when it is legal, and if you're not going to have a move of God when it is legal, what are you going to do when it's not legal? Okay, so let me just, and let me stop and let me say this. We redeem people, and I need to just leave it at that because in most of the European nations and some of the African nations and a couple of the Asian and some of the Asian nations where we rescue girls and we redeem those girls, the, the age of sexual consent is as low as 12 years old and prostitution is legal. Meaning I can pay money to molest a 12-year-old child, but if I pay money to redeem them and buy them from a trafficker, that makes me a trafficker. So it's illegal to pay money to set a girl free, but it's legal to molest them. That's the world that we live in. And so uh, you, 
I, I want to just tell you that if you wanted to, and, 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 and by the way, you would also receive criticism like what I receive criticism. So, well, you're the reason why there's a market for sexual trafficking. No, honey, the reason why there's a market for sexual tra trafficking is because the entire world is addicted to pornography. Come on. Come That's on. why there is there is a market for sexual trafficking, not because there are a tiny handful of Christians that are actually doing something about it. That's right. So if I get this argument from people say, well, you're actually part of the problem in the name of responsibility, you, we should never be a part of that. Does that sound familiar or what we've been talking about? And this is what they say to me. They say, you know, you're part of the problem. This is what I say to them. If you were to go back and if you were to live in Texas prior to 1865, and if you were living in the very same place where I live, you would have encountered slaves. And if you were like me and if you were an abolitionist and if you wanted to set those people free, you would have two choices. You would either buy them and set them free or you would steal them and you would move them. You're welcome to give me the third choice, but I don't know what that is. So nobody calls the abolitionists prior to 1865 part of the slave market. It's ridiculous and stupid. That's right. That's right. When Abraham Lincoln set all the slaves free in Washington, D.C., he did so by causing the government to buy all the slaves and then set them free. Wow. Whenever England finally abolished slavery, it was the English government that bought all of the black people, paid them off, and then set them free and say nobody's allowed to buy them anymore. Wow. Nobody calls them part of the market. Right. So it's ludicrous and stupid, and I'm the wrong person to try and argue that with because I'll, I'll say no. I know what I'm talking about, and you don't know what you're talking about. The second part of that is this. If, if you're going to... So number one, if you are going to buy a human being and if you're going to set them free, you will be, it's not going to be safe and you're not going to get along with people over it. Here's what I say, do it anyway. Now I know we can't have the courage to gather, but certainly we can have the courage to risk our lives Come and on. our money on buying human beings. No, if you're not going to have the courage to gather, I promise you you're not going to have the courage to do that. <laughs> All right, the other side of that, the other side of that is this, if you snatch them and move them, that's also dangerous, and you're also not going to get along with people. And if you don't have the courage to gather and don't have the courage to worship because it might be dangerous and you might not get along with people, I <laughs> promise you, you're never going to go snatch a girl and haul them off. And it's why I just shake my head at the majority of the leadership of the American church and say, you wink, you weak and impotent, left-wristed, knuckle, limp-wristed knuckleheads. You have the power of the Holy Spirit within you to change the world, and you're worried about getting along with people, and you're worried about safety. My God, God help us. We need to repent. So to answer your question, you can be a part of Troy Brewer Ministries. You go to troybrewer.com. You can call us. We have a number, 877-413-0888. And we can walk you through. This is how you can participate in this. This is how you can sponsor uh, if you want to help us actually sponsor. a. We know exactly where to get people, how to get people. We can walk you through the different ways that we do that throughout the world. And you can be a part of any of that that you want to. And then furthermore, once we're able to travel again, like in nations like Belize, come on, come go with us. You can come down and meet these girls that, that you actually set free. Wow. And you can, can actually you, do Can that. you give us some numbers again as far as what you guys have been able to accomplish? Um, just now, again, we've been doing this for 30 some odd years, but we've been doing it randomly. Uh, we started doing this strategically in 2017. And since 2017, just since, since the beginning of 2017, which was really the end of 2017, and then, and then 2018 and 2019, it's 2,200 and something girls and something around 6,000 babies that actually come with them. And that's just been in the past couple of years, man. And uh, we uh, thank God. Are you ready for this? Thank God for the coronavirus because it shut down international borders for about six months. Wow. And there's no sexual trafficking across borders for six months. Wow. What it, and so we were able actually to, we, we're, we're ready now and we're launched. We just opened up our bridges again 
uh, between Nepal and India because they just opened up the border again and we were able to put together teams like we're ready when this thing opens dude we're ready to get it and so those numbers are going to start drastically going up the numbers of girls that we rescue we also actually pay for the prosecution of traffickers whenever wow. we catch them wow that's awesome and uh, last year we we caught and paid for the prosecution of 41 traffickers last year Come on. and yeah and every one of them got a 20-year sentence or more. It's every incredible. single one of them did. And so shutting down entire networks. Um, we, we had one of the greatest miracles we've ever had happen while the coronavirus happened. Because when it comes to in, in some of our Asian com countries, we have people that work undercover and know where these kids are at these brothels that... You can't just go in and bust uh, the traffickers at the brothels because if they have some of these children farmed out, they'll murder them because they'll come back and testify whenever they come back. And so you have to be able to catch them all at the same place, which they're never at the same place. And when it comes to these third world countries, you might have to pay off a judge, pay off a whole bunch of police people and arrest them and get them prosecuted and get them in jail in one day before the mafia comes in and pays off everybody. Wow, wow. And, it's a, and, if, and if there's kids that are farmed out during that time, those kids will disappear and nobody ever will see them again. And our teams know these kids. Sometimes they have to watch them literally for years looking for a day that they're all in the same place. And... Uh, so anyway, the bottom line is uh, I got a call from a friend of mine and a miracle happened in March for the first time ever because of the quarantine. There were 41 kids all under the same roof in one day and we were able to go in and bust them. We arrested 11 traffickers, Come on. got them all sent to prison and we freed 41 children in one single day and that was in March. <laughs> Crazy. Come on. Stupid, man. Thank yeah. you, Jesus, for quarantine. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Jesus, for quarantine. Exactly. Like, look at what you're doing, God. We would have never imagined those kinds of things. We couldn't imagine. Uh, we could not have imagined a scenario like that uh, four months ago, five months ago. We couldn't have imagined a scenario like that. And this one guy who's been watching this, he knows these kids. He knows them. The whole world thinks that he's a pedophile, and he's a drop dead sold out Jesus freak with a wife and with a bunch of kids. <laughs> And he poses as a pedophile so that he gets to know all these kids and mark down their names and their ages so that when the day comes that there's not one missing, you know? And, I mean, can you imagine people that are out there living that life for King Jesus? Sure. Meanwhile, we worry about if somebody's mad at us or maybe we're not safe. Sir, would you please cover your whole nose while you're talking to me? I want to tell you, I want to tell you, God help us if that's the spirit that's in us, bro. <laughs> and I, is there not a cause? Right. And I'm trying to speak in a very soft way right now <laughs> because I know it's so critical and I don't want to cause any kind of condemnation for anybody. I hate condemnation. I hate, I hate shame. But I would say this, if that's been you, repent. Come on. Repent and say, dude, I'm not going to be who the world tells me to be. I'm going to be who Jesus tells me to be. And I'm anointed right now, and the Spirit of God is with me, and I can make a world-changing difference right now, right this second. We had a girl in Fort Worth, Texas. We just rescued, uh, uh, literally owned by a pimp in Fort Worth, Texas, last week that, the, that we just now rescued. The week before that, an 18-year-old girl in Arkansas that we rescued, 18 years old, has the mind of a 12-year-old and the body of a 12 or a 13 years old. There's something not right with her. She's been in the foster care system her entire life. On her 18th birthday, she got kicked out on the street and was enslaved as soon as she got kicked out of the foster care system. In the United States of America, right here. And there she is out there getting farmed out and being abused in ways like nobody can imagine. One, a friend of mine in Arkansas who feeds homeless people, but she feeds homeless people looking for girls that need to be rescued. And she does this. She finds this girl, and before she came to Burleson, Texas, from Arkansas, she contacted 64 churches and parachurch agencies, and everybody said, we can't be involved. Wow. <laughs> wow. We are the body of Jesus. And if, you're, if your highest priority is peace and comfort and safety, you're not being a part of the... That's right. I, I, 
I, you probably shouldn't have asked me that question, Pastor Darren. I just want to just encourage you, man. Just tell you, I'm not saying everybody should do what I'm doing. I'm saying that everybody should do what Jesus is doing. And he's not social distancing. He's not hiding. He's not, he's not uh, playing it safe. He's taking great risks for all of us. And he loves us. And he's, he's personally involved. And we can never, ever, ever get away from that or the church is toast. So purchasing somebody out of the sex trafficking industry, purchasing somebody and rescuing them, that is illegal. So we could never do that. We would never want to encourage. So just for the record, we yeah. wouldn't want to encourage no, so anyone to give any sort of money, to, money for to, do, to do something that's illegal like rescuing somebody out. of. But let's say hypothetically. Thank you. That that uh, that my family and I hypothetically, not that we would, <laughs> right. but like like how much money? Um, uh, w w Typically three thousand bucks. Three thousand. Hypothetically, and how that works is this: like in India, three thousand dollars. It works like this: anybody and their dog knows where to find a loan for three thousand bucks. And wow. to an Indian, that is ten million dollars. And they don't know that three thousand dollars doesn't last very long. They don't know that. So some lady, her husband gets sick, he can't work. There's always a guy standing on the corner saying, if you need money, I can give you money. Three thousand bucks. Okay, here's I'm gonna go buy some medicine. Your husband dies, you cannot pay that back. You are owned. You are a literal bond servant. And you can pay off that bond. You can find out who owns that bond. Because what they do is they say, now we own you and you will be a prostitute. Wow. And they have no choice. They're like, well, I got to do this because I'm a bond servant. But you can find out who owns them and who owns the bond on that, and you can pay that bond and literally set them free. But is there anybody in the world that's willing to go find somebody that they don't know and pay off $3,000 of debt? Right. I want to tell you, the body of Jesus does not do that. There's nobody else coming. That's right. Right? In Mexico... Like all these families in all these dumps. The reason why there are families in those dumps is because they got a loan. They couldn't pay off the loan. And then the Mexican cartel comes to them and says, here's the deal. You can sell your daughter's bodies in our brothel or you can work as a family in the trash dump. And they never get out. And then they have kids that grow up in the trash dump. And then their kids grow up. And you have second, third, and fourth generation. And they own 400 bucks. They owe 400 bucks or they own whatever. I mean, it's unbelievable. I, I, I've never, I've never bought a family for 400 bucks, but I have for 600 and something, really? but it's typically a couple of thousand dollars and that's it. And then you're literally setting those people free and same exact thing. If you can get in with the guys that own the brothels and say to them, look, I want to, how much does this family owe? Let me pay that off and let me set that girl free. That's I incredible. will give you the cash to do that. That's incredible. Um, and Troy Brewer Ministries dot com. Yes. Thank you so much for everything that you're doing. Com. Thank Troy Brewer yeah. dot com. Yeah. Troy, thank you for everything that you're doing in the kingdom. Thank you for coming to Seattle. Thank you. Uh, amazing last night. Amazing this morning. It's this fun. afternoon has just been incredible. Love you. I love you, brother. God bless you so much. Thank you for who you are, man. Awesome.